In today's episode, we're going over what physical therapists need to know about Pez answering pain. What's going on, guys? This is Dan Pope and Kevin Coughlin. We are physical therapists. We work at Champion PT and Performance. We are back at you with another episode, breaking down the latest evidence on different pathologies. Pez answering today, giving you the relevant data, throwing the rest in the trash. We're also working with these patients on a regular basis. I had a few Pez answering patients, and I want to share some of what I learned. And uh, yeah, we hope you take away some some good information that you can help your patients become one uh, percent better. How are you doing today, Kevin? I'm doing well. Uh, I feel like Pez Anserine is like when you're in school and you learn about the mitochondria, and everyone knows <laughs> it's the powerhouse of the cell. I feel like Pez Anserine is the thing that all the PT students know is the goose's foot in Latin. But uh, that's that's about the extent of what I know about it until you're about to melt my brain and teach me all about the goose's foot of the knee. Oh, we'll see if I do. Yeah, we'll see. So first up, Pez and Serenus, goose's foot in Latin. Funny story. I thought that was goose's foot in French. <laughs> and I have several French patients and I was always like, oh, Pez and Serene, that's that's French for goose's foot. And they're like, I don't think so. I think you're wrong. <laughs> And I was like, really? And we looked it up. And yes, it is not French. It's actually Latin. So <laughs> that's so good. All right. A little anatomy about Pez Anserine. So it's basically a series of tendons from the gracilis muscle, the sartorius muscle, and the semitendinosus muscle. And essentially, I want to talk about some of the actions of these muscles because it may or may not be relevant in treatment. So the gracilis, kind of interesting reviewing this and what all these muscles do. It's a hip adductor. It also performs hip rotation, both directions, depending on the degree of flexion or extension of the hip. So nice and confusing for you. Tibial internal rotation, which most of these muscles do. We'll talk about that in a minute. As well as knee flexion. The sartorius, interesting because it's a hip flexor. It's also a weak AB doctor. So doing the opposite of the gracilis. It's also an external rotator of the hip. It does knee flex as well, or excuse me, knee flexion, as well as tibial internal rotation. Semitendinosus, obviously a hamstring muscle, so it's going to extend the hip. It also is going to internally rotate the hip. It flexes the knee and also helps with tibial internal rotation. And one of the things I thought was kind of interesting about this group of muscles, and it's kind of similar to the IT band stuff we went over recently, is they collectively protect against valgus and rotary forces. So if you think about the IT band, it's going to help a little bit with various forces of the knee, uh, which could be relevant for things like LCL sprains. And if you think about the inside of the knee, the pes anterior, oftentimes tibial femoral joint pathology, mainly osteoarthritis or potentially ligamentous instability can lead to pes answering problems, potentially because all these muscles here are protecting against valgus and rotary forces. So we tend not to think of these muscles as anything, but let's say hip abductors, knee flexors producing force. They also create stability at the knee joint. And that may be one of the primary drivers of pes answering pain. Right. And I call it pain because we're not even sure exactly where this pain is coming from. More about this later. But I just thought that was really interesting. If you think about the function of these muscles, they're going to help with valgus forces and also rotary forces. Right. Pardon the interruption, but I've got something you're definitely going to like. It's an evidence based cheat sheet on Pez answering pain. All right. I know it's probably not that exciting, but because you don't care about it, you probably don't know that much about it. So I've done the work for you. This action-packed cheat sheet has everything you need to know about pes answering anatomy, mechanisms of injury, prevalence, risk factors, pathophysiology, diagnosis, differential diagnosis, prognosis, and lastly, treatment. What are we going to do about this problem? And my promise to you is I'm going to catch you up to date on pes answering pain in under 10 minutes. This cheat sheet is 100% free. I'll leave a link in the show notes in the description. Go ahead and click on that and get to learning. Now, back to your video. Little information about the pes anserinus bursa. It sits right underneath of the collective tendon, right? It is a synovial lined structure or fluid filled sac. Generally speaking, it's not filled with much fluid, but when you have pes anserinus bursitis, 
the idea is it can fill up with fluid. And then when you do an MRI, you'll see more fluid within this bursa. And it's supposed to facilitate smooth movement between the tendon and the tibial bone. So a little anatomy for you. Let's see if I can make this a little bit bigger. So I apologize. This image is not phenomenal, but I'm trying not to use a whole bunch of copywritten images so I don't get sued by someone at some point. Essentially, this is a view on the inside of the knee. Apologize to the podcast listeners. I would hop over to YouTube at some point to check this out. So on the left side, you've got the medial aspect of a knee with all the muscles intact. And you can see the sartorius. You can see the gracilis, the semitendinosus, all attaches on the medial tibia. I want you to keep in mind just how low it attaches. So when folks have pes answering pain, it's pretty far below the medial joint line, right? That's one of the main ways you can kind of differentiate it between more joint pathology or pes answering issues. If you look at the image on the right, they've cut the sartorius gracilis and semitendinosus, and you can actually appreciate the answering bursa, and it's right underneath of those three tendons. So the thought being is that if you compress that bursa too much, it can obviously lead to some pain. Any thoughts just looking through that right there, Kevin? Yeah, there's definitely a lot going on in that area. Um, but I think interesting, like you said, drawing the parallel between the IT band uh, resisting varus forces and the pes anserine uh, resisting the valgus stresses of the knee. So just, you know, pops into my mind is perhaps this is something to target with like an MCL sprain uh, or something like that, which I'm, I'm sure you'll talk about. But uh, yeah, just pretty interesting, the anatomy there. Mm -hmm. A little spoiler, there's not great research on this, right? Um, and I do anecdotally see this in a bunch of athletes, which most of the research is not on athletes. It's in kind of older women with knee osteoarthritis um, and oftentimes with issues in the medial knee. So that does make sense. But from a rehab standpoint, we may be thinking about providing more stability at that medial knee, right? Uh, some of those valgus forces, trying to get better at controlling those some. All right, Kevin, what is the mechanism of injury for pes anserine pain? So we still don't really know. There are a whole bunch of theories, and there's not great research on that. So take everything what I'm saying with a bit of a grain of salt. This is not super well studied, right? But the idea is that this is a repetitive stress injury, or sometimes it occurs due to direct trauma. So sometimes you have a patient falling right on the inside of the knee, and that gives them some immediate pes anserine bursitis potentially right? But the idea is you have valgus knees, and there's some research supporting this, right? Or you have collateral ligament instability, which is often associated with osteoarthritis. So quick little information about osteoarthritis, depending on the compartment that has osteoarthritis, let's say that's medial or lateral uh, tibial femoral osteoarthritis, you can have a patient that presents with a valgus or varus deformity, right? So if you have a valgus deformity and you've got lateral compartment osteoarthritis because you end up having less space in that lateral compartment, you're going to potentially put a little more strain on the MCL, right? More strain, obviously, on the lateral compartment too, but maybe that leads to some issues on the medial side of the joint as well. And we're seeing this in folks who have collateral ligament instability too. So if I can't control forces very well with my passive restraints, maybe those active restraints are doing more. So the pes anserine muscles right? And the tendon that crosses over. These can all also occur in field sports, uh, particularly in field sports that uh, have a lot of lateral movements. With the thought being is that if you're moving laterally a lot, let's say basketball or racket sports like tennis, you have higher valgus forces, right? Uh, and basically you have high hip adduction, knee and hip flexion, and medial tibial interrotation demands, which is essentially kind of what all of those muscles do. So you're putting a lot of strain through those muscles, which A, could be aggravating the collective tendon as it attaches, which more on that a little bit later, or at least compressing the bursa underneath, right? And essentially, all of this can create either a bursitis, and the way they try to figure this out is they will MRI the knee in folks where they think they have pes anserine pain, or they may find a tenosynovitis. I'm not a radiologist, but from the research I was reading, it's a little tough to differentiate between the two via MRI. Right. And again, a little bit of a spoiler alert, but folks that have pes anserine pain oftentimes don't have any MRI findings. So 
Is this a little bit of a reactive tendonopathy or something else that's going on with the tendon? Who knows? I will say there's not enough research, at least I could find, to hang my hat on any you know theory of the exact mechanism of injury, what's occurring. Uh, Pez answering pain also occurs with medial joint derangements, right? So if you have medial meniscus uh, injury or an MCL injury, the thought is some of that localized inflammation or swelling can extend into the Pez answering area. Maybe it sensitizes those structures there uh, and causes some pain in that region. Any thoughts there, Kevin, before we move on? Um, no, that all makes sense. Just curious if in your research, did you see any um, sports that seem to have slightly higher rates of this at all? Yeah, there was one paper from like 97 and they were just saying that anecdotally it's like, it's tough because papers will say it's common in runners, but mm -hmm. then not quote any research that actually shows it's more common in runners. Sure. And the, the stat I talked about the rotary or the, uh, more frontal plane athletes, that was also a total theory. So mm -hmm. you're not going to find a paper that says like, yes, the incidence is higher. Like we have a ton of that in like the patellar tenopathy world or like patellofemoral pain, but we know the populations where it's more common. And there's one study I'll mention in a minute. Um, that gives us a little bit of information about where it's more common and how common it actually is. But mm -hmm. no, there really wasn't good research at all to tell us where, um, anecdotally I've seen it, you know, recently in a Frisbee athlete, they do a ridiculous amount of running. Right. I've also seen it in a Olympic lifter, a CrossFitter too. And essentially it was, you know, squatting, squatting aggravated, which was weird because the pain was right in the Pez Antrine area, which not common as a term, like a form of knee pain in those folks usually. Mm -hmm. Right. What is the prevalence of Pez answering pain? So let me give you a little background on this study. Uh, link in the show notes if you want to read any of these studies. But essentially, this study was looking at 509 patients with knee pain or swelling, and they're only taking patients with suspected tibiofemoral derangement, right? So folks that may have some osteoarthritis, cartilage issues, meniscus issues, we know that these knee problems only make up a small percentage of total knee pain. Because the big players are usually things like patellofemoral pain, right? So in this study, the guess was folks that had what seemed like Pez answering bursitis made up only 2.5% of all of the knees. And essentially, they used a clinical examination and finding MRI evidence of fluid in the Pez answering bursa or tenda as tendon as a diagnostic criteria. They also ruled out other causes of knee pain. So if they basically did an MRI and they found like a big old meniscus tear in the medial side, they ruled that person out as the main cause of their pain being the Pez answering bursa, right? So only 2.5% of these knees, right? And that's 2.5% of a category of folks have knee pain that's not common. So I think you can kind of guess that it's much more, uh, much less common than other forms of knee pain. You will find a bit of research showing that in asymptomatic knees, about 5% of those folks do have Pez answering bursitis, but those are in folks that don't necessarily have knee pain. So there is, you know, a high percentage of folks have asymptomatic findings too. So reading through this article, there's not much, there's very little research on the prevalence of this. And, um, you know, this study by itself is just kind of showing that if folks seem to have tibiofemoral joint pathology, it's going to make up a very small percentage of those, right? So not that common, essentially. Anything to add to that, Kevin? Yeah, I would say that's kind of in line with what I think I see. Um, this, you know, admittedly isn't something that's on my radar a ton. It probably should be a little bit. Um, but, you know, it's not one of the more, like, like you said, it's not one of the more common sources of knee pain we'll see. But it's something we should have... Um, we, we should have on our minds it's something when we see someone with medial knee pain, um, I'm sure you'll get into the diagnosis, but this is something we want to be able to rule in or rule out uh, just to make sure we're, we're targeting the right treatment approach with our, with our patients. But um, definitely not something I feel like I see all the time, you know? Yeah. It's funny you said that. I know we talked about this in clinic, but you know, when we were deciding which podcast we want to do for the knee, it's kind of like Pez answering. What do you think? So I was like, ah, I don't really want to do it. It's not that common. But I think one of the issues too, especially in like the information age where we are currently, sometimes these pathologies that are a little bit more rare, you can't really find a whole lot of great information on how to treat them. They end up being more popular um, topics just because it's like, I don't know how to treat this. You know, like who the heck knows how to treat it? Is there good research? I'm not sure. So 
hopefully this podcast ends up helping some folks out. And, you know, you know obviously there's less people with Pazzi answering issues. Uh, but I also find that some of the more common pathologies like patellar tenopathy we're talking about, way more common, but I feel like people have an idea of how to treat this. So it's not really as helpful for folks, you know? Mm -hmm. So hopefully I can help some folks. <laughs> All right, Kevin, what are some potential risk factors for folks with Pez and serene pain? So I'm going to start with the theories just because these are exactly that theories. So essentially these papers are trying to figure out why folks might end up having more Pez and serene pain without any evidence to back up their thoughts. Okay. So it's important that people understand that. So the first theory is that if you have tight hamstrings or tight adductors, which kind of makes sense. You may form, may have some excessive compression or friction in the medial knee, right? Which is kind of like the whole thought process behind what we used to think about ITB pain, right? In my mind, I always wonder like, is IT band pain kind of the same thing that's happening on the inside of the knee with Pez Anserine pain? Mm -hmm. It seems like a pretty dang similar issue we got going on there, right? So that's a thought, which obviously could be wrong. We're not sure. Uh, flat feet, potentially because it causes an abnormal lower extremity alignment, kind of thinking about that whole valgus talk we had previously. So maybe that is increasing valgus forces at the knee, which again, not good research to back that up. I just knocked out a cord in my computer. Let me put that back in so we can actually continue downloading. Uh, participation in sports with a lot of lateral movement. So the thought being maybe basketball, tennis, right, where we're resisting a lot of valgus forces and rotary forces. And the last one, we chatted about this a couple minutes ago, long distance runners, long distance running, putting some valgus forces at the knee. Maybe they're ending up with more Pez answering issues, right? If it is kind of a snapping issue or a compressive issue, you know, thousands and thousands of repetitions, is that causing some issues at the medial knee, right? Potential risk factors. Let's dive into some actual risk factors based on very weak evidence, right? So we can't necessarily hang our hat on these risk factors, and I'll, I'll show you where some of this is conflicting, but uh, Pez and serene pain is not well studied, but you will find some studies that are looking at some of these risk factors. Now, the first one you see is knee osteoarthritis. So if I have a lot of knee valgus due to tibiofemoral joint pathology and some collateral ligament laxity, potentially also due to not knee osteoarthritis, maybe stretching the medial structures, right? Maybe some MCL strain, so on and so forth. Uh, that could be a potential risk factor based on the study listed. Type 2 diabetes, also a potential risk factor. Female gender, another risk factor. In one study, 34 out of 94 patients with diabetes myelitis had PES answering bursitis, which is wild. And 90% of those were female, right? So it seems like there's a higher likelihood in females. Study by Alvarez Nembegiai et al. Apologize, Alvarez. Uh, botched your name. Valgus knee deformity alone or association with collateral instability. There was no association between, oh, excuse me. So one risk factor was valgus knee deformity alone or association with collateral instability, but was different than the other studies. They found no association between Pez answering uh, pain and diabetes and knee osteoarthritis or obesity, right? So some other studies have shown as a risk factor. This study did not. It was a smaller sample size. So, you know, we, we know that's not great research. And Usal, Usal et al., if you guys want to read any of these research articles, we'll put them in the show notes, right? Uh, found that 20% of patients with primary knee osteoarthritis had concomitant Pez answering bursitis, which is a lot, right? 20%. That's pretty wild. And there was a direct correlation was reserved between the severity of osteoarthritis and bursitis size. So that's an MRI findings. So more arthritis means maybe more fluid in the Pez answering bursa which we know is oftentimes asymptomatic, right? So take this all with a grain of salt. What do you think there, Kevin? Yeah, I think that's good stuff to, to have in mind when you're seeing um, patients, you know, with some of these issues, whether it's uh, someone with diabetes or someone with osteoarthritis and potential uh, ligament laxity, you know, just something to keep in mind when you're looking at someone with medial knee pain, um, that this, this could be a contributor Again, so we can target our treatment the, the right way to help get them the, the results they want. Hey friend, if you're liking this content, I have something I think that you're really going to love. And that would be a master course on rotator cuff related pain and rotator cuff tears. Having the patient come through the door and you don't know how to treat their pathology, that stinks. 
you feel like a fraud, you're just making stuff up, it's not good stuff. It's also pretty dang tough, staying on top of all the literature that's coming out all the time. Well, guess what? I have done this for you by making a master course on rotator cuff related pain. Well, what kind of stuff do you go over in this course? I've got an evidence-based guide. We go over diagnosis and special tests. My favorite beginner, intermediate, and advanced exercises. How to modify your patients' train in the gym so they can keep on working towards their goals and not hurt themselves more. My favorite evidence-based manual therapy techniques for these folks. Case studies on how to treat non-op and post-op patients, as well as the exact rotator cuff-related pain protocol that I give to my patients when they come to see me with this common issue. Now, that sounds pretty good, Dan, but how much does this cost? How does a dollar sound? Whoa, one buck, that sounds crazy. Why is it so cheap? It's mostly because I don't know how to run a business, but I do know about the rotator cuff, and I'll teach you all about that. This all comes with a subscription to Fitness Pain for Insiders. It's $1 for one week trial and 25 bucks per month afterwards. However, you can cancel at any time. If you don't like it within the first seven days, just tell me, I will cancel and refund for you. Plus I have a lot of other really good courses in there as well. We have master courses for cervical radiculopathy, lumbar radicular pain, lateral ankle sprains, and what I'm working on next is, you guessed it, your favorite, shoulder instability. So click on that link in the description, it's one buck. Go ahead and get started and I'll see you on the inside. The care that they need. Mm. All right, pathophysiology. This one's kind of interesting, right? Because from a history perspective, we used to think that every tendon problem in our body was a tendonitis. Until we found out it wasn't a tendonitis. Then everything was a tendinosis. And then you have this, what seems like a tendonitis. And we're calling it a tendonitis. We haven't studied it yet. So do you think this is a tendonitis? Do you think it's a tendinosis? Is it tenosynovitis? What do you think there, Kevin? Any thoughts? I'm going to say it's definitely a uh, tenosynovitis. Mm. All right. So basically, and I took this directly from a study here, um, pathological studies have yet to conclusively pinpoint whether the symptoms are primarily result from bursitis, tendonitis, or fasciitis in this area, right? And this is because it can be difficult to diagnose even with clear symptoms. And imaging techniques like ultrasonography and MRI often do not reveal any pathologic changes. Now, this to me is important that we figure out because this is going to lead to a different treatment depending on what you see, right? So if I have a, a purely inflammatory issue going on, then I probably want to offload a little bit. And offloading allows the inflammation to die down. And then once inflammation is down, I just ramp back up again. But for tendinopathy, I probably want to load it, right? And I'm probably going to be a little bit more liberal in terms of how much pain I allow when I'm exercising because we have a whole bunch of research on, let's say, the pain monitoring model. It says, yes, it's okay to load these things. But if it's a primary inflammatory issue, maybe we need to take a week of doing nothing, let this thing completely die down, and then kind of ramp back up again. I think the problem is that we don't have this research, and we don't really know. And it might be different. My thought is that it, the way an osteoarthritic older female is treated is probably going to be different than like a 17-year-old male playing basketball, right? And we haven't parsed that out whatsoever at this point. So largely it's a little bit of a confusing thing to treat. Right. And I was a little bit underwhelmed looking through the literature and a little sad, but that's okay. Right. Just means we probably need some more research, but in, in, in some of these, you know, issues aren't that common. You're not going to see too much of that research. Right. Um, any thoughts on that before we move on, Kevin? Yeah, I think that's, that's so important. I kind of think it's exciting to see that like, Probably the research on pen pezanserine is like in its infancy. And I'm sure we'll learn a lot over the next several years and, and decades and stuff. Um, because you're right, like the management strategy could be completely different. And maybe there are different flavors of pezanserine, different things causing pain. You know, and like you said, if this is a acute tendonitis or a bursitis, we're gonna manage it a little bit differently than if this is a, you know, chronic like tendinosis type thing. So interested to see, you know, how we can better figure this out for our patients, but, um, you know, important, to, important to figure out, I'd say. Yeah. And it, it's funny to me too, when I was going and doing a lit review, cause I would find like a more recent article from like 2015, which isn't that recent. And then another one, like 2023, 2024, I was like, Oh good. Some newer research on this. And you look at their references and like, 
they're basically citing an article from like 1937. They're like, all right, well, uh, this is, isn't really conclusive. And like, you probably won't be able to get that article anyway to see what's going on, you know? Mm -hmm. Or one thing I found is that there are a lot of articles referencing textbooks and the textbooks were not actually drawing some of their information from research studies. They're just theories, right? So it's a highly theoretical thing. Okay. So that being said, how do we diagnose these folks that may have PES and serine, bursitis, tenosynovitis, so on and so forth? So one is just a, a thorough history taking. Generally speaking, this is going to be a little more common in middle-aged females. Think about osteoarthritis, right? Think about folks that have valgus knee deformities. Probably going to take a little longer in your life to develop those issues. So you're going to see it in folks that are a bit older, right? Also seems to be a little bit more common in females. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, last two patients I had that were younger, it was a male and a female. So it doesn't necessarily fit that. Um, could also be an athlete in a change of direction sport. So don't rule that out completely. And then also potentially in the distance runner, right? That could be one of the things you're dealing with. From a subjective standpoint, what are these folks saying? So it could be a gradual onset of pain. In some folks, it's sudden. Think about trauma to that area. So I fall right on that PES answering area. That could create some issues, and that's a traumatic event. So ask patients, you know, what bothered it? Where did they hit? What got kind of kind of dinged in their fall, whatever it was? They could have pain with running or descending stairs. That seems to be pretty consistent. Folks have trouble with descending stairs. Very common with folks who have knee pain, right? Descending stairs seems to be one of the tougher ones. Also, pain with crossing the legs. Not sure if maybe when you cross your legs, you're kind of exposing some of that valgus, right? Or potentially exposing some of that ligamentous instability. That's creating some pain. They can also have tenderness and or swelling on the medial knee. And we'll go, we'll go talk about the objective uh, tests in a second. But what's interesting for these folks is that the pain is a little bit lower. And the swelling is usually a little bit lower than that medial joint line. So if we're trying to differentiate between the two, the location of symptoms might end up being really important. Uh, keep in mind that image we showed you, you know, 20 minutes ago, what it was uh, showing where the location of symptoms are. It's actually pretty dang low on that tibia which is a little bit interesting, right? Uh, anything else to add from a subjective perspective, Kevin? Um, I guess just a question for you in the, the patient that you said you saw who was the ultimate Frisbee player. Um, what were their chief complaints to you coming in? What were they getting symptoms with? And did you see swelling at all? Yeah, so no swelling. Um, pain was right in the Pez answering area, mm -hmm. right? And I think she actually had some pain with resisted A deduction. Mm -hmm. kind of makes sense with the gracilis, but what gave her most of her symptoms, and this is what I tend to see, are quad-based exercises. Mm -hmm. So like deeper squatting, single-legged squat, things that really put strain, and not to say like the adductors aren't active with some of that stuff, but things that really kind of strain the quad, which maybe from a differential diagnosis, I was just treating the wrong thing potentially, mm -hmm. right? But her pain was right on the pez answering area and it was tender right there. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing that bothered her was higher speed running and then aggressive cutting and pitting pivoting. So she could run. She just couldn't run that fast. Mm -hmm. When she had to cut or pivot, that's when she had a lot of pain. Right. Yep. And from a treatment perspective, I tried to treat it a little bit like a tendinopathy. Um, and then she also eventually ended up getting a cortisone shot, which helped her tremendously. So that was the thing that did it for her. Yep. So going back to the whole idea of like, is this an inflammatory issue? Right. If it is, maybe cortisone would be a great treatment for a lot of mm -hmm. folks. And I don't want to spin my athlete's wheels because essentially I treated her for a few weeks. She wasn't getting better. And then she literally just got a cortisone injection because she had a really big competition coming up, cleared it right up. Right. Mm -hmm. So can't say that was hundred percent effective and it will be hundred percent effective for everybody, but we'll, we'll discuss some of the research on cortisone and versus exercise, which is a little frustrating, but yeah, I want to know what's best for my treatments or my patients, because I, I don't want to spin their wheels. Right. Mm -hmm. Saying like, this is the way to treat it when really it's not, you know, pain with palpation. Did you notice? Uh, I'm trying to remember now. I want to say not too bad. Okay. Yeah. I don't Good really thing. remember. I should have went yep. back and looked at my notes before I ended up doing this podcast, but that wasn't something that was super clear to me. Like when I poked yeah. on it, I was like, she would say that my pain is right in this region that I'm poking mm -hmm. on right now. But if I poked on it, I, I don't remember if I actually reproduced her pain a lot. Almost like yeah. a patellar tendinopathy, where if you ask them if their pain is right in the spot and they say yes, but sometimes it's not sore sensitive, you know? Um, yeah. I don't know. And yeah. maybe higher level stuff with the person you're talking about. Maybe if it was super flared up, hurt with palpation. Yeah, Exactly. Yeah. Again, I don't remember. So, you know, take that with a grain of salt. Got a leaky brain, leaky brain syndrome. <laughs> it's your All gut, right. man. Yeah. 
How about objective measures? We have any special tests, right? Strength. What is important from an objective standpoint for these patients? So one, tenderness to palpation, right? So basically having pain at the medial tibia below the joint line. So we spoke about this previously, but even if they don't have tenderness to palpation right by the pes answering area, if their pain is right in the area below the joint line, you might start thinking this seems more like a pes answering issue, not something like a tibiofemoral joint issue, right? And I think that's one of the, the dead giveaways is symptom location, mm -hmm. almost like patellar tendinopathy. It's like, all right, is it right on the patellar tendon? Yes, it seems like it is. All right. I don't think this is patellofemoral pain, right? Mm -hmm. Or Osgood Schlatter's. Like we know what we're dealing with with that symptom location. Obviously, we don't have good research to support this, but at least that's kind of my reasoning. From a manual muscle testing perspective, should we be trying to resist knee flexion? Should we be trying to resist tibial internal rotation? Should we be trying to do resisted adduction to see if we compress that, you know, irritated tendon or bursa? Maybe. Um, although we don't have good research about things like sensitivities and specificities, we also don't have a gold standard test to figure out if someone has PES answering problems. So we're pretty far out from getting very accurate objective tests from this not type of pathology, right? Um, do folks have pain with something like a single legged squat or step down? One of the biggest, um, subjective complaints in these folks are going to be pain descending stairs, right? So when we do something like a single leg squat or go down the stairs. Like obviously we're stressing a lot of the structures within the knee. Um, it doesn't always make a lot of sense to me why this would aggravate someone with PES answering pain, but this might be a special test to help you rule that in. So if you're trying to basically provoke a person that has, you know, symptoms of PES answering pain, then a single leg squat might do that. Right. The other test you'll see floating around from an idea perspective, theoretical perspective is a hamstring length test. So essentially putting someone on their back, flexing the knee to 90, flexing the knee to 90, and then from here trying to extend the knee, which you're looking to see about 70 degrees or so. And if they're less than that, maybe that hamstring tightness is leading to some compression on the medial side of the knee, right? So a couple of ideas from an objective standpoint. Uh, any thoughts on those tests there, Kevin? Yeah, th those all make sense, right? Different tests to try to induce stress by the PES answering and just see if it replicates replicates their sit their symptoms and then always good to keep in mind as your treatment progresses something you can come back to and see you know are we making progress here so maybe you know you, you have a loose diagnosis of PES answering and then you have your asterisk sign of something that hurts you do some treatment um you progress over time and you see that you know single leg step down down a stairs getting better then, you know, I think you nailed the diagnosis and you're, you're on your way to getting the patient back to where they need to be. Yeah. I, I think the thing that just, I wrestle with is like, all right, well, if someone has a hamstring strain injury, single leg squat feels pretty dang good. Mm -hmm. Like why the heck is a step down painful and a patient that has pes anterior pain, maybe something to do with the sartorius or the gracilis, right? But it doesn't yeah. seem to make sense from like a, a symptom standpoint. But that yeah. is what these folks will tend to report. Maybe these folks are dealing with concomitant knee osteoarthritis, and that's the reason why a step down hurts. Hard to know, right? Yeah, it's maybe, like hard to know. Said, maybe there's maybe there's some like co-contraction around the knee, and if it is like the bursa that is pain inducing, sometimes that compression could induce pain a little bit more than like a hamstring strain is more like you know the stretching that really bothers it. So. You know, I'm sure as we learn more about this um, diagnosis, those things might make a little bit more sense, but it is interesting. Yeah, very interesting, right? Well, hopefully we'll learn more of the course of time. Okay. I think this one ends up being really important, and it also kind of leads you to a kind of critical reasoning that PES answering might be the primary cause of pain, but we have to have a thorough differential diagnosis, and we're just ruling out other forms of medial knee pain. So... The big one being tibiofemoral joint pathology, and this is going to be medial knee pain, tibiofemoral joint pathology, and that could be, let's say, the MCL, that could be the medial meniscus, this could be cartilage injury, this could be osteoarthritis, right? Could be any of those structures crossing over the leg. So if you have tibiofemoral joint pathology, you can potentially expect to have some joint line tenderness. And I think this comes down to palpation. Is your pain right in the joint line or is it slightly below, right? 
Do you have any pain at end range passive flexion or extension, which would potentially indicate some sort of tibial femoral joint pathology, but wouldn't potentially flare up Pez anterior pain? Are there large amounts of swelling, not just over the Pez anterior area, but around the entire knee joint, right? And I think the other part is that when a patient comes in, what are their subjective complaints? Were they just playing soccer, felt like a big twist in their knee? Now they have a bunch of medial like knee pain and they had a sharp pain in their knee, cutting, pivoting. You're like, well, this seems like they maybe just tore something and they need to go back to the doctor. It doesn't seem like they have Pez Anserine issues, right? So subjective may help to drive some of the actual diagnosis. And then if someone is potentially dealing with MCL pathology, they maybe do some valgus testing, which maybe that does flare up the Pez Anserine as well. So hard to tell, but I would expect pain right over that joint line pain and palpation in the MCL, and then valgus testing would probably aggravate an MCL injury. And next one, potential bone stress injury, right? So, you know, this one may be a little bit more far-fetched, but if you're dealing with some sort of tibial injury, you saw how the Pez Anserine basically is on that medial tibia, you know, an inch or so below the joint line. You know, don't, uh, I don't know if it's exactly one inch, but it is a little bit lower, right? Uh, fact check me on that one. But if someone had a recent increase in running, or weight bearing, and maybe they are not fueling or they have a poor diet, they lost some weight concurrently. I don't know. Maybe they're dealing with some sort of bone stress injury in that area. And the last one, and this is potentially what I was dealing with my athletes, uh, maybe they have a hamstring tendinosis, and maybe that's related to the semi tendinosis. And maybe we need to do a better job of trying to diagnose the hamstring via hamstring testing um, with stretching the hamstring or strength testing, right? Maybe we're dealing with just tendinopathy of the distal semi tendinosis potentially, right? Uh, any thoughts there, Kevin? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, right? Like differential diagnoses for some of these challenging diagnoses like Pez Anserine pain is, you know, if we rule out some of the other things that could be causing this, then we get a pretty good lens that this might be what we're dealing with. So I think that's always a good um, exercise for clinicians to go through is, you know, rule out as many other things as you can. Um, so you're not, especially like one of the things I was thinking about when you started talking about this was a proximal, um, tibial bone stress injury, right? So you want to make sure you rule out those types of things that we don't want to miss, um, that might be time dependent, right? Like, like you had said, if someone has a pivot twist and they feel a pop in their medial knee, um, yeah, that's something, you know, we need to be able to figure out and get this person uh, referred if we have to, um, or stop activity if it seems like a tibial bone stress injury. So yeah, those are always really important things to, to do is differentially diagnose. And then if you know, if you rule out all the kind of scary things or things that require um, a referral, then let's start our treatment and, and roll with the current diagnoses and kind of see how we how we fare out with our treatment. If you guys like what you're learning about so far, then the next logical step is to sign up for the fitness pain free mini course. I've made an absolutely free mini course and we go over four vital lessons for coaches and clinicians. The first lesson goes over how traditional schooling has failed us. Now, I'm actually a really big fan of education, and I think that physical therapy school actually prepared me pretty well to work with the average person. However, I really didn't learn how to work with the population that I want, which is people in the strength and fitness world. So I'm talking about powerlifting, bodybuilding, Olympic weightlifting, sport of fitness, and really people that just love working hard in the gym. And really my goal with the mini course is to help you understand how you work with this population to get them out of pain and keep them training. The next lesson is seven reasons why people get hurt in the gym. So it's vitally important they understand the injury mechanisms or why people get hurt in the gym. If we don't understand why folks are getting hurt in the gym, it's going to be very hard to rehabilitate those folks because let's say we do get them better, they go right back in the gym and get hurt in the same exact way they hurt before. The other piece is if we want to keep these folks safe for the long haul, we have to understand the main reason why these folks get hurt in the first place so we can keep them in the gym training as safe as possible and minimize that risk of future injury. Next, we go over four simple steps for getting your clients out of pain. Now, Rehab can be very complicated. There's a lot of systems out there that make it very challenging to figure out how to work with your patients. 
However, it really doesn't have to be that complicated. So I go over four easy steps you can follow to get your patients out of pain and back in the gym where they belong. Lesson number four is how to build the career of your dreams and earn the respect of your community. Let's face it. The reason why you take these educational courses is obviously so you can learn a little bit more, but really the deep seated reason is because you want to have the respect of your community. You want your clients to come in, work with you and say, wow, Joe was great. He did a phenomenal job with me tell their friends and their friends come to see you. And after a while, you're very valued and respected within your community. So I'm going to teach you how to do that. Second piece is that if you know these skills, it doesn't always mean you have a ton of patients going through the door so you can work with the population you want to work with, right? So you may be the absolute best coach in the world, but no one wants to come and see you because they don't know who you are and they don't know how good you actually are. So we'll teach you how to get the patients through the door that you want to work with. And lastly, we'll talk a little bit about the fitness pain-free certification. This is the largest and most comprehensive educational course that I offer, but more on this later. So I'll leave a link in the description, in the show notes. Again, it's 100% free, really easy to download. Go ahead and do that right now. How about prognosis? Do these patients get better or do they die with this issue? Right? <laughs> so... <laughs> Seems like treatment of the Pez Anserine is mostly favorable with conservative treatment, which consists of, let's say, some rest or relative rest, activity modification of either your sport or activities like stairs, hills, running, use of NSAIDs. There's some research of in, uh, diclofenac being effective in the treatment of Pez Anserine bursitis. Then physical therapy. Physical therapy always makes me laugh a little bit. Right. Because you get these like textbooks that will recommend physical therapy as a first line treatment. And you're like, what does the physical therapy consist of? You know, <laughs> it's like saying like nutrition is helpful as well. It's like, well, what the heck does that mean? Like you, everyone eats food. You know what I mean? Food is helpful for weight loss. Like you got to know about the specifics. So what I did was I tried to go through the literature that said physical therapy was effective. And what I will say is that a lot of those textbooks or studies, there was no link to a research study saying that physical therapy was effective. So I think it was a little bit theoretical, right? Or I don't even know where they come up with these conclusions, but um, there were some studies that show that physical therapy was helpful and we'll go over those. But I would say largely when you look through some of this literature, look through these textbooks, they're, they're just saying physical therapy is effective without any sort of citation, right? So you got to take that with a grain of salt. All right, let's move on to treatments. So here's a study. I was excited when I saw this comparison of the efficacy of physical therapy and corticosteroid, corticosteroid injection in the treatment of Pez Anserine tendinobursitis. So this study was kind of cool because they were saying that it's not just a bursitis. We know a TNOC device is part of it. And I was like, oh, cool, physical therapy. We'll see how this fares. So essentially, the physical therapy group consisted of a hot pack for 20 minutes, ultrasound for five minutes followed by the ultra effective tens unit for a total of 20 minutes, right? And what do they find? They found improvements in outcome measures, right? Uh, as well as a timed up and go test, which kind of gets, you know, leads you to, you know, believe that these are older folks with probably some pretty severe osteoarthritis that don't move too well. Right. But if we just throw a bunch of modalities at these patients, it seems to be beneficial, right? And a bunch of modalities shotgun at your patient seems to have the same outcome as a corticosteroid injection, right? So when I read the study, I was kind of excited. I was like, okay, cool. What does physical therapy consist of? Um, no exercise whatsoever in this study. So just shotgun some manual or some, uh, modalities seems to be helpful in a, in a group of patients. Um, what are your thoughts when you hear this study here, Kevin? Are you excited by it? <laughs> God. Yeah. How do they call that physical therapy? That's just therapy. I don't even I don't know. know what it is. But yeah, yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting that it just that was comparable to a steroid injection. You wonder if that's more just like relative rest, like they're just doing less and they feel a little bit better. But yeah, um, yeah, I'm being elitist too. You know what I mean? Like maybe right. people do just need a bunch of modalities and that's going to make them feel better. I just yeah. wish they included some exercise as well, just to see if there is a difference, you know? Yeah. Uh, right. But yeah, that, obviously that study wasn't awesome, right? We didn't get a chance to see what physical therapy can truly do to help folks based mm -hmm. on our understanding of exercise being very beneficial. So here was another study. 
This was basically looking at physical therapy with naproxen. So they took naproxen with physical therapy and they compared that against kinesio taping. It's like, all right, cool. This seems like it's a, a pretty interesting study. But what was the physical therapy group with naproxen? So essentially, patients in this group took naproxen for 10 days and they also had 10 sessions of physical therapy consisted of hot pack, TENS, and phonophoresis, which that's an interesting one. Don't see that one popping up too much. And there was no exercise whatsoever, right? Unfortunately, the kinesio taping group got kinesio taped one time per week for three weeks, and they used a lifting technique to reduce swelling. So if you're familiar with kinesio taping at all, essentially you can tape in a way that reduces swelling. The idea is that the tape kind of lifts up the skin somewhat and allows reduced swelling, which is pretty cool. I've never tried it. You can put it on like a post-op patient that's really bruised up. Kinesio tape goes on. A day or two later, they have less bruising where the tape was, which is kind of crazy. And what they found is that the kinesio taping group, they had reduced pain and they had reduced swelling. And they actually had a pretty good measure. I think they used sonography or something to actually see if there was less swelling uh, and not just like eyeballing it or a sweep test or something along those lines. Um, but the kinesio taping group actually did better than the physical therapy group, which is interesting. So maybe in our patients that have um, Pez and serene pain, we give them some hot packs, some tens. We give them, you know, some modalities. We combine it with some, some kinesio taping. Maybe that's the way to go. I don't know. But again, there is, there is no actual exercise in this group. So any thoughts on this study here, Kevin? Yeah, I'm always pro uh, trying tape if, if, you know, it could provide any benefit and just it's easy enough to do. You can easily teach your patient to do it on their own at home. And if they find it provides a little bit of relief, I think that's worth doing. It's not too um, costly. And again, it's easy to replicate. So you know, you could try it, I guess, and, and see um, if it's helpful, I, you know, and if it allows them to do more exercise, which is definitely what you and I are going to promote, you know, to me, sure, definitely do a little KT tape. Yeah, it's funny, too. I, it's funny because, like, the pendulum is swinging again. Like, in social media, you would have all these haters of manual therapy come out. But a lot of these haters of manual therapy is now saying, hold up, manual therapy seems to work similarly to exercise, right? And then you have a lot of haters of things like kinesio tape saying like, oh, this is like placebo. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting to me is that, A, yes, there's a bunch of studies showing that good short-term results, but this is showing an objective change in swelling. Mm -hmm. That's swelling is a, a big thing that we deal with on a regular basis with patients. Should we be you know, kinesio taping more? Mm -hmm. um, just like a, a study that Obviously, people are not talking about. I don't know too many folks are spreading this study about <laughs> Pez answering pain and like kinesio taping, but you will find interesting little tidbits from studies like this showing that, like, wow, that's an objective measure mm. that changed with taping. And everyone's saying that kinesio taping does nothing. And this is showing the opposite of that. And this is actually a research study, which is a higher level of evidence than, you know, expert opinion. Mm -hmm. So you got that at least. How about this? <clears throat> Let's come up with some theoretical treatments. Just because from a physical therapy perspective, we're not really sure what to do. We don't have a lot of great research. What can you trial with your patients? What well, seems like it's probably a smart idea to offload aggravating movements. And this may be sporting activities or lifestyle activities. If we know, like my prior patient was a Frisbee player, she had a lot of trouble with high speed activities, a lot of sprinting, right? A lot of high speed cutting that bothered her, but she could run. I had her run as much as she was able to. We offloaded the aggravating movements, and then we slowly started to increase those aggravating movements over the course of time via lower loads, like ladder drills, eventually during shuffling drills, and then kind of higher speed stuff. And she did pretty well. The other person that I was working with, he had a lot of pain with squatting. So we tinkered around a lot with his squatting. Um, and basically, we altered his stance a lot. We altered his depth, his, the tempo that he lifted with, the frequency of squatting, a lot of different things. And eventually his Pez answering pain went away. He ended up with other forms of knee pain. So eventually he's, he's, he's doing fine at this point, but he was dealing with more Pez answering and we got rid of that. Um, if we can reduce some tension on the bursa. So there's one case study where stretching was one of the primary treatments from a physical therapy standpoint. 
where they stretch the adductors as well as the hamstrings. And this person did get better. But again, that's a case study, right? It's not a randomized control trial. There's no control group. Who knows? Um, if we can have athletes better able to tolerate knee valgus and rotary forces, so maybe we strengthen the PES answering muscles via specific isolation exercises or stability exercises. Maybe we'll decrease some of the strain on the PES answering bursa just because muscles are better able to handle those forces, right? Uh, maybe we can try to improve knee stability and strength via strengthening the quads, more single-legged balance. Again, just strengthening all the structures to support the medial side of the knee, right? Maybe we try to treat concomitant osteoarthritis. So in these studies where we're treating PES answering issues, uh, some of these patients also had knee osteoarthritis. We know the exercise is beneficial for knee osteoarthritis. Maybe just treating those concomitant issues will drive some success at the PES answering area as well. And like I already stated, a slow progression back to previously offending movements. What I will say is I, I find that we try to be very evidence-based, right? And that's, a, that's great, right? But when there's like a total lack of research, I'd like to at least give folks some expert opinion on how I've at least tried to treat this over the course of time. But do take this with a grain of salt. Do you have any other pearls from a treatment perspective for these folks, Kevin? No, I think that's the... Uh the fitness pain free framework, right? It is. I like it. Temporarily, yeah. re, you know, reduce the aggravating movements, load, increase load around, the, you know, load tolerance around the the painful area, and then progress back to the goal. So, mm -hmm. definitely a good a good piece of advice there. I think the other thing is that, you know, there's research in certain pathologies, pes answering being one of those, frozen shoulder maybe another one of those. Modalities can be helpful. Mm -hmm. So maybe we hit them with a bunch of modalities, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe we are ultrasounding the crap out of this thing. Uh, we'll talk about shockwave. Maybe we shockwave this thing. Maybe we tape this thing. Maybe a more passive approach is actually better for these folks. I don't mm -hmm. know. I mean, I'm just so biased towards exercise that it's hard for me to even say that. But if you look through the research we have so far, it seems like those things are helpful. We should probably do that, you know? In refractory cases, so where physical therapy hasn't been effective, what can we try? So one, cortisone injections, right? What I will say, and I'm starting to learn the nuances between different types of doctor doctors. So a lot of surgeons, not all of them, they often will not do ultrasound, ultrasound guided injections into tendons. It's just a little bit more common for physiatrists to do that. And there's a bunch of research to show that ultrasound guided cortisone injections are more helpful in patients that have PES and serene issues to the point where when folks are not using ultrasound, they're very bad at figuring out where that tendon actually is, right? So if you go back to your orthopedic surgeon and they're just like jamming a needle into your knee and they're not actually using ultrasound to guide that, you're not going to have the best outcome. Probably need to find a doctor that can actually ultrasound and guide that, right? There's also some research on prolotherapy or oxygen ozone injections, which I have never seen. I just found that in the literature being equally effective as cortisone injections. Anecdotally, I have had patients that had success with cortisone injections. I've had two of them in my recent memory that had some success with cortisone in that area. And one of them was actually not having any progress with treatment. Um, and the cortisone was very helpful, right? So it might be something you suggest a little bit sooner. Uh, this is generally not an area that we know of that's very high risk to inject. So there's no research I know of that if you inject the PES answering with cortisone, you're going to rupture those ligaments, uh, or excuse me, tendons. But then again, there's not a ton of research out there. So maybe it is more dangerous than we think. Uh, extra corporal shockwave therapy is something else that's been shown to be effective and folks have PES answering issues. Uh, I am more interested in the specifics now that we use a shockwave, um, machine. I use it pretty much every single day of the week. It's kind of crazy. There's so many studies coming out showing that it has a pretty good effect that I'm just like, why not throw it at the patients? It's fast. It's easy. Uh, so in these studies, they're using a four hertz frequency, which is very slow. I go like 10 to 12 because uh, I'm impatient. Oftentimes, I want to speed up the treatment. Uh, they used 1,500 pulses, which anecdotally, I use somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 um, for most of my patients, and a 0.15 millijoules per millimole, which I think you know for the machine we have is around 150. So for folks that actually use extra corporal shockwave, hopefully that helps you out because, you know, if you start looking at the research on shockwave, um, they have 
different dosages all over the place. And if you start looking at the research on PRP, we're finding now that the dosage is very important. And a lot of times these studies are showing a dosage is too low, not having an effect. And then the medical commu community just writes off the treatment as not effective. But in reality, the dose is wrong, right? So I do think it's important that we think about the dose when treating patients. And basically, they had three total sessions, one time a week for three weeks. And they had an improvement over control week, at week three as well as week eight. So it's interesting. There seems to be like some sort of mechanism where shockwave will create a healing cascade, whereas cortisone kind of does the opposite, right? I did find a study that was comparing PRP injections with cortisone or extracorporeal shockwave. And what they found is that the cortisone was superior, right, compared to shockwave or PRP, although they were all effective, it's just that cortisone was best, but they only had short-term results, which we know is a problem because cortisone injections may lead to longer-term issues, uh, whereas shockwave and PRP potentially has a better long-term outcome, right? But these are all things you can try. So you have a patient that's not getting better. You can try cortisone, other types of treatments like shockwave. I would start shockwave right away in my patients if you have access to it. And then if they're not getting better, maybe we, you know, send them to orthobiologic stock to consider things like PRP. What I will say is that they had a nice graph that showed progress of cortisone versus shockwave and PRP. And there was a statistically significant difference. It was very small, very, very small difference. So all of these things seem to be beneficial. And then lastly, you will find some research on a bursal excision. This is uncommon, and there's not research to show um, just how successful this is. Uh, but generally speaking, there is a surgical treatment you can try where they can try to take out the bursa. They can also drain that bursa as well. So shoot some cortisone into it, maybe drain that bursa. There's, there's some different options for your patients there. Any thoughts on those treatments, Kevin? Yeah, I, I think like you had said, um, there needs to be some better studies perhaps with what physical therapy can offer, but you know, we can't be, uh, too arrogant and thinking that physical therapy is going to be the key to this, or, you know, really the only key to everything we treat. Um, it's good to have relationships with doctors in the area or, uh, ortho biologic docs, or, you know, that kind of thing that we can, we can have in our back pocket for a referral. And maybe we can do a combination of the two, but I know, um, like the relationship we've formed with our local, um, biologic stock, Eric has been very helpful for referring, uh, patients for these different, different type of problems that just don't seem to get better with only physical therapy. So I think we need to be humble and understand that, um, this is a team effort and there are cases and peasant serene might be one of those diagnoses where bringing in that support. Um, will lead to better outcomes. So, you know, it's not like if you're not seeing the progress you want after six to eight weeks, you just tell the patient like, Hey, sorry, I don't, I don't know what else to do for you. There are other options we can consider. So I think that that was helpful and important to go over. Yeah. And it's also a little tough too. Like, I don't know, I'm not trying to fault surgeons. They're, they're trying to like stay on top of so much literature. I, you know, this is just an interesting finding that we found because we're doing a deep dive on pez answering bursitis like this mm -hmm. is not going to pop up on a surgeon's radar where they know i need to be particular about the way i inject this mm -hmm. i can very easily see a doc being like where's it hurt boom put it right in there i've been in the room with doctors shooting cortisone injections it's usually not super specific right mm -hmm. it's one instance where it probably is important and essentially these a lot of the orthobiologic docs i'm sure there's bad ones and good ones but that's what they try to stay on top of is, you know, research on these specific injections. So, um, yeah. And they usually do ultrasound guided too, which seems to be beneficial. So yeah, I agree with you hundred percent. Sorry for the aside there. I think it's important that physical therapists find some good physiatrist friends. They're really good allies for us and surgeons are too, right? Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to poo poo surgeons, but they can be very, very helpful, um, uh, both in the short and long term for your patient outcomes. So it's one instance where that really could be a game changer for your patient. All right, guys. So you're an expert at medial knee pain created by the pes answering bursa or tendon. But you might not know how to treat the opposite side of the knee, good old IT band pain. Well, here's the thing. Kevin has a link directly over his head. I want you to go ahead and click on that link above Kevin's head. And what we'll do is go over everything you need to know about IT band pain on the outside of the knee. Click on that link, and I'll see you there.
If you're watching this on YouTube, please, please, please hit that like button. Consider subscribing to the channel if you enjoy this. If you're listening to the podcast version of this, please give me a five out of five rating. It helps tremendously. And lastly, if you want to go that next step and support me further, consider subscribing to Fitness Pain-Free Insiders. So Insiders is like Netflix for physical therapists and coaches working with painful folks in the gym. You've got access to 100 plus webinars, ebooks, and courses. More recently, I've been taking all of my best content from YouTube. I've been taking out all the ads. I've been organizing it in a really step-by-step -step fashion in an entire course so you can easily go through it. And I add additional pieces to this to enhance your learning, right? So I just finished up my lateral ankle sprain course. And one of the big things I add to this was a protocol. So essentially, what do you do week one, week two, week three, week four, week five, six, seven, eight? You know me, I like working with athletes. I like working with really fit and strong people. So it's going to be a lot more robust than your typical protocol. Also, you have access to me. So inside of insiders, you can leave a comment and I'll get right back to you. I also have physical therapy CEUs inside of insiders. So if you take the course Essential Coaches Series, get a bunch of CEUs. And what's even better is you can start for just $1. After that, it's $25 per month. It's going to be the cheapest CEUs you can get. It's by far the highest value program that I offer at the cheapest price. So head over to fitnesspainfree.com, click on the programs link, and then click on Fitness Pain Free Insiders to get started. I'll also leave a link in the show notes where you can check it out.